I have dealt with the first of Colonel Gonzalez's four forces and deployed two additional recon drones, one in high cover position to plot the origin of any fire directed at the other, which has given me a current position fixed on the second of our detachments. The Wolverines are moving at their best speed through the dense jungle, approaching peak velocities of 47 kilometers per hour, but my own speed is now 62.37 kph. I will intercept the aggressor force 2 in 9.46 minutes on my current heading, and I examine my terrain maps once more. My quarry must cross an east-west ridge approximately 11.2 minutes on their current heading. This will bring them above the jungle canopy and present me with a clear line of sight and fire. I decrease speed accordingly. I will let them reach the crest of the hill before I... A new datum registers abruptly, and I redirect my sensors. A large spacecraft, correction, two large spacecraft, had entered my tactical sensor envelope. The approach in line ahead from due south on a heading of 017 degrees true at high subsonic velocity. Descending at 4.586 MPS, I could remain memory for comparative emission signature and identification is reached in 0. .00367 seconds. They are Concordiat Navy Fafner class assault transports, but they do not carry Navy transponders. I'm confused. If these are indeed Navy craft, then their transponders should so indicate. Moreover, if the Navy intended to carry out maneuvers on Santa Cruz, my commander should have been informed, and I am certain would have informed me in turn. The presence of these units cannot therefore be considered an authorized incursion into my command area. The factors continue on their original course. My projection of their track indicates that the first of them will cross the Santa Cruz fleet base perimeter in 10.435 minutes at an altitude below the fleet base's normal search radar horizon. My battle center projects a 92.36% probability that they are on an attack run, and I attempt to contact my commander. There is no response. I initiate a diagnostic of my primary transmitter, even as I activate my secondary. Again, there's no response. My diagnostic systems report all transmitters are functioning normally, and I feel a moment of fear. My commander should be monitoring the exercise. He should have received my transmission and responded instantly, yet he is not. I lock my main battery on the Fafners, but without authorization from my commander to enable my battle reflex imperatives, I can only fire if the unidentified vessels take obviously hostile action. I bring my long-range tactical systems fully online while attempting once more to contact my commander. Yet again, there is no response, and my sensors detect a sudden energy release at the approximate coordinates of the fleet base. Analysis of sensor data indicates a hypervelocity kinetic strike. Lorenzo Esteban jerked up at his veranda chair as a huge white fireball erupted above the field. He stared at it in horror for an endless second, until the rolling shockwave shook his entire hysenda by the throat. Then he dashed into the house and thundered upstairs to the second floor. He snatched up a pair of old-fashioned optical binoculars, jammed them to his eyes, and peered toward the field. He could make out most of it from here, and he swallowed an incredulous curse as he realized the mammoth explosion was centered on the Wolverine maintenance shed. The lead factor has passed beyond my horizon, but the second is still within my engagement envelope. Simultaneous with the explosion, two outsized assault pods detached from the visible vessel. Their mission signatures identify them as Dragon Tooth class pods. Reusable, rough field capable AFV pods configured to land either a full battalion of manned tanks or a single bolo in each act of opposition. Only after my hellbores will bear, but the explosion raises the possibility that an attack by hostile forces is in progress to 98.965%, sufficient to enable independent battle reflex release. I have time to engage only the Fafner or the assault pods. Main memory indicates that a Fafner's short-term life support capability and internal capacity are sufficient to support three infantry battalions and their vehicles in addition to a complete loadout for two Dragon Tooth class pods for a ship-to-ship -ship planet transfer. Given this datum, and the fact that the ship is still on course for the fleet base, it must be classed as the primary threat. My hellbore elevates to 026 degrees, I acquire a lock, and then I rock back on my treads as for the first time. I fire a full power war shot. Madre de Dios! Consuela Gonzalez flinched as the self polarizing direct vision blocks for Wolverine's hatch cupola went dark as night. Even so, the searing flash from somewhere astern of her made her eyes water, and it was followed instantly by an even bigger mid air explosion. Hellbore, her sensor tech screamed. That was a hellbore, Connie. My god, what's that thing shooting at? My fire impacts on my target's primary drive coil. Destruction is effectively instantaneous, but I cannot relay my hellbore in time to engage either assault pod. 
they go to a base of action and disappear into the jungle. 4.0673 seconds later, I detect ground shock consistent with the heavy daisy cutter charges used to clear pod landing zones and heavy terrain. The enemy has landed successfully, but the detonations provide me with reliable bearings to their LZs. I continue my efforts to contact my commander. The depot communications computer responds to my demand for a diagnostics check and declares all systems nominal, but still my commander does not reply. His continuing silence is a dagger of ice within me. But with or without him, I am a unit of the Unicorn Brigade. It is my function to defend human life at all costs, and I must act to protect the citizens of Santa Cruz. I attempt to contact the fleet base over my secondary comm channel without success. I attempt to transmit a subspace attack warning to Sector Central, but the orbital communication array does not respond. Radar indicates they no longer exist, indicating a deliberate enemy move to isolate Santa Cruz. I attempt to access the planetary surveillance system, but without my commander's assistance from the depot's command center, I can only work through my permanent telemetry link to the maintenance computer. I begin the reconfiguration of the system to download tactical data to me, but the interface is clumsy. It will require a minimum of 5.25 minutes to access the reconnaissance satellites. I alter course to a heading of 026 degrees true to close in on the assault pod landing sites, while I consider my other options. The presence of the SCM detachments grants me a greater degree of tactical flexibility, and I activate my tertiary comm channels. Colonel Gonzalez, please respond on this frequency. Consuela Gonzalez shook her head. The rain of debris pouring from the cloud of incandescent gas, which must have once have been a spacecraft, had not yet hit the treetops, when a soprano voice she had never heard in her life spoke to her from the comm. Colonel Gonzalez, please respond immediately. Santa Cruz is under attack. I say again, Santa Cruz is under attack by forces operating in unknown strength. Please respond immediately. She forced her eyes down from the holocaust in the sky and punched in a new frequency into a comm panel with trembling fingers. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is Gonzalez. Who the hell are you? I am Unit 23 Baker 0075, November Kilo Echo of the Line. You're the Bolo? Affirmative, Colonel. I have detected a kinetic strike in the low kiloton range at the approximate coordinates of Santa Cruz Fleet Base. I have attempted contact with Fleet Ops in Sector Central without success. Further, I have established that Santa Cruz's subspace communications arrays have been destroyed. I have also detected two Fafner-class Concordiat Navy assault ships on an attack course for the fleet base. On the basis of this data, I do believe Santa Cruz is under attack. I... But... But why? Gonzalez blurted. I have no information on the attacker's motives, Colonel. I simply report observed facts. May I continue my sit rep? Consuela Gonzalez shook herself once more, then sucked in a deep, shuddering breath as her merely human mind began to fight for balance. Go... I have engaged and destroyed one Fafner. Christ, someone muttered. But not before to attach two Dragon Tooth class assault pods. I estimate their LZs lie approximately 45.3 and 51.459 kilometers respectively from my present position. I am currently en route to locate and destroy any hostile forces at these locations. How can we help? Gonzalez demanded. Thank you for the offer. If you will shift to condition Delta-2, I will download my own tactical data to your onboard computers. But a Dragon Tooth pod is capable of landing up to a Mark 25 Bolo. It is therefore probable that the enemy has deployed a force too heavy for your own units to engage successfully. I request that your battalion rendezvous at map coordinates Echo 7 Niner X-Ray 1-3 and stand by to assist my own operations. You got it, Bolo. Watch yourself. Thank you, Colonel. If I may make us another suggestion... It might be wise for you to broadcast a planet-wide alert of hostile action. We will. Gonzalez nudged her contact shoulder with a toe and jutted her chin at the panel with her own fingers darted at the master computer console. Delta-2 online, she told Nike, and looked at her driver. You heard the lady. Take us to the rendezvous coordinates, and fast. Esteban was still staring at the explosion when a flicker of movement caught his eye. He snapped around, staring further south and shock gave way to the fury of understanding as he saw the huge spacecraft sweeping toward the field. It went into low-altitude hover almost directly above the old fleet base and began shedding AFB assault pods. Huge hatches gapped at its flanks, and a cloud of anti-cavalry mounts erupted from them. He followed within seconds by the first infantry assault vehicles on counter-grab drop rings. That sight jerked him into motion. He thundered back down the stairs and into his communications center and his lips drew back to bare his teeth as he flung himself into the chair before the console. He might never have seen the Navy duty, 
but he'd always taken his responsibilities for the field more seriously than he chose to pretend to others. That's why he'd installed a certain landline link he'd never bothered to mention to anyone else. He flipped up a plastic safety shield, punched in a three-digit code, then rammed his finger down on the big red button. After one CO pounded on his command chair arm and sprouted a steady, monotonous stream of profanity. The attack, which had begun so perfectly, had gone to hell in a handcart, and he was frantic to get back out into space before something else went wrong. The communications arrays were down, that much at least had gone according to plan, but nothing else had. The two Fafners had docked with Matichuk's mothership to take on the maximum personnel loads their life support would permit them to handle for an assault run, then had made their approach from the planet's southern pole. It was the long way to reach their main objective, but had let them come in over largely uninhabited terrain, and as a bonus, deploy the two golems to cover their southern flank if the plan to deal with the bolo had failed, as judging by the evidence in it had. The transport commander swore again, harder, his tactical readouts had confirmed it. The single shot that killed Fafner too had come from at least an 80 centimeter hellbore. That meant it had only come from the bolo, and he didn't want to even think about what else that might mean. His sensor section reported that golems had separated before the attack, so they at least might have gotten down intact. But a quarter of the marauders' infantry, half their air cav, and 10% of their panthers had gone up with Fafner too. He darted another look at the status board and felt a stab of relief. 90% of their passengers had launched. Another few seconds and... Last man out, someone announced. Go! Get us the fuck out of here, the CO shouted. The Fafner's nose rose as it swung further north towards safety, and he glared at his comm officer. Tell Granger that goddamn Bolo's still alive. Far below the hovering transport, a dozen slabs of Dura alloy armor slid sideways to uncover an equal number of dark, circular bores. Deep within the wells they had covered, long quiescent circuitry roused that received the activation command from Lorenzo Esteban's distant communications console. Targeting criteria that were passed, received, evaluated, and matched against the huge energy source in the sky above. My sensors detect a fresh burst of gravitic energy from the bearing of the fleet base. It is too heavy to emanate from any planetary vehicle, and must, therefore, be the first Fafner. It is accelerating away from the base, but its commander appears to be no fool. Although I can detect his emissions, he remains too low for my fire control to acquire him. I compute a probability of 99.971% that his current maneuvers will indicate the successful deployment of his assault force, but I cannot intervene. Missile acquisition! We've been locked up! Someone screamed. Fafner 1's commander started to twist toward the technician who'd shouted, but he never completed the motion. Twelve surface-to-space missiles launched on pillars of fire. Their target raced for safety as rapidly as its internal grab compensators permitted. So fast its bow glowed cherry red but it never had a chance. The SSM's conventional boosters blew them free of their silos. They tilted, holding lock, and then suddenly went to full power on their own countergrav. They overtook their victim at just over 300 kilometers downrange at an altitude of 33,000 meters, and 12 20 kiloton warheads detonated as one. There was no wreckage. The warhead's glare was bright enough to bleach the brilliant sun of Santa Cruz at even at 300 kilometers range, and Esteban snarled in triumph. He didn't know why anyone would want to attack his world, but he knew at least one bunch of the murderous bastards that would never attack anyone else's. Not bad for an old croc with no formal training, he thought venomously. And then, thank God Enrique and Milan ain't back yet. He shook himself and climbed out of the back of the chair. Whoever these people were, they weren't going to be very happy with him for wrecking their transport. On the other hand, he had spent 70 years on this very hacienda, he knew places where an army of raiders couldn't find him. He paused only long enough to grab the emergency supply pack he kept handy for search and rescue operations, slung a 4mm military power rifle over one shoulder, and vanished at the back door at a run. My sensors detect the EMP of multiple nuclear detonations at a range of approximately 392.25 kilometers, bearing 030 degrees relative. This coincides with the estimated locus of the second Fafner, and the previously detected heavy gravitic emissions have ceased. I compute a probability of 98.511% the Fafner has been destroyed by defensive fire, indicating that my commander's friend, Lorenzo Esteban, has managed to activate the fleet-based defenses. I hope he is not paid with this with his life for the success. I detect two new emission sources, 
Their locations correspond to the projected landing loci of the previously observed assault pods. They each match my files for SC191B fusion plants and are accompanied by narrow band encrypted communications transmissions. I attempt to penetrate the comm link, but without immediate success. Analysis indicates a sophisticated multi-level security system. I devote 1.0091 seconds to consideration of available data and reach a disturbing conclusion. The energy signatures are consistent with the power plants of either a Mark 24 or Mark 25 Bolo. No other mobile unit mounts the SC-191B. I do not know how the enemy could have obtained a current generation Bolo, but if these are indeed Mark 24 or Mark 25s, I am grossly overmatched. Despite the superiority of the system's major Stavakas devised for me, I compute a probability of 87.46%, plus or minus 3.191% that I will be destroyed by two Mark 24s, rising to 93.621% that I will be destroyed by two Mark 25s. Yet my duty is clear. However the enemy may have obtained access to such war machines, I must engage them. Colonel Gonzalez, I have detected what may be two hostile bolos, the soprano voice said calmly, and Consuela Gonzalez's olive complexion went sickly gray. Bolos, in the hands of planet raiders? It wasn't possible. Yet she was receiving confirmation of nuclear air bursts from outlying melon growers over the planetary comm net, and the transmissions from Cuidad Boulevard were a babble of hysteria. Her comm tech reported the sounds of explosions and heavy weapons fire in the background of the Boulevard transmissions. There could be no doubt that the capital, including her husband and children, were under heavy, ruthless attack, and no one had even a hint of what was coming not even a second to organize any sort of defense. Nausea twisted her stomach as she thought of all the civilians who must be dying even as her tank bucked the jungle at 100 kilometers to the south. And if those bastards had brought a bolo... What do you want us to do? She rasped over the calm. I will engage them, Colonel. Your own vehicles lack the capability to survive against them. Continue towards the specified rendezvous, then advance at your best speed on a heading of 2634 True for 42 kilometers before changing to a heading of 039er. That course will pass to the west of the enemy's current location and take you to Cuyadad Boulevard in the shortest possible time. You can't take on two other bolos on your own. Your assistance will not appreciably enhance my own combat capability, Colonel, and your units will be of far more utility to Santa Cruz and Cuyadad Boulevard than they will if they are destroyed here. Please proceed as I have advised. All right. Vaya con Dios, amiga. Colonel Louise Granger stared at her display in shock. She didn't know what had happened to Fafner too. Her transport command ship was on the wrong side of the planet, where it had just finished off the last communications array. But the sudden cessation of all transmissions from Fafner 1 was chilling proof her careful battle plan had just been blown to hell. One hadn't even managed to report a damn thing about what was shooting back before it destroyed her. But she'd gotten off her full load of assault troops and armor to take out the field in the planetary capital before she died. That put her point of destruction well to the north of the Bolo Depot. So whatever had killed her, it hadn't been the Bolo. Granger didn't know what else on the planet could have done the job. Whatever it was could only have come from the old fleet base. Though how anyone could have had time to activate its defenses was beyond her. What she didn't know was whether or not Fafner II had gotten off her golems before its destruction. And unlike a Fafner-class transport or a full-capability Bolo, a golem had no subspace comm capability. She couldn't find out what had happened to the huge tanks until her ship swung back over the radio horizon. She felt the shock and dismay rippling through Operation Saf. And she didn't blame them, but she also knew at least three quarters of a brigade's fighting power down on its primary objective and, presumably, intact. Whatever air to ground system had nailed Fafner 1 wouldn't be much use against a ground assault. And she snarled at her shaking officers. How the fuck do I know what happened to her? But whatever it was, it must have come back from the fleet base. And we'll clear its horizon in 15 minutes. Get all those command circuits and keep our people moving. Primary objective is now the complete, I repeat, complete neutralization of that base. I continue my efforts to penetrate the enemy's communications without success. Yet analysis of their patterns convinces me they are not the total systems data sharing net of the Dinochrome Brigade. While they include what can only be interlinked tactical telemetry, they also include what are clearly voice transmissions. This indicates that my opponents are not in fact bolos, and I compute a probability of 56.113% that they are actually Golem 3s or Golem 4s. Possession of such vehicles by any enemy, 
while still extremely improbable, is more likely than the possibility that the enemy might have somehow acquired full capability units of the line. While the odds against my survival against properly coordinated golems remains unfavorable, the probability of my destruction against Golem 3 has dropped from 87.46% to no more than 56.371%, although it remains close to the order of 78.25% against Golem 4s. The probability that I can successfully destroy or at least incapacitate the enemy, on the other hand, has risen to 82.11%, regardless of the mark of Golem I may face. My battle center cautions me to assume nothing. Yet the intuitive function Major Stavakis incorporated into my personality center argues otherwise. If I assume that these are indeed golems and plan my tactics accordingly, my chance of victory and survival will be considerably enhanced. If I act on the assumption and it proves incorrect, my destruction will be assured. I consider for 0.90112 seconds and reach a conclusion. I will assume my opponents are golems. Two huge war machines, each crewed by three very anxious humans, forged their way through the jungle like impatient titans, bulldozing their way through hundred meter trees while their commanders shouted at one another. It had to be the friggin' Bolo! Gollum 2's commander bellowed finally, stunning his counterpart in Gollum 1 into silence with its sheer volume. And if it was, it's coming after our asses next, so shut the hell up and listen to me, goddammit. If there's a live Bolo out there, then let's get the fuck out of here. No, damn it! if we run, the damn thing will come right up our asses, and we've already lost both factors. If it gets to the field, there's no way in hell Granger or Matichuk will rip trying to pick us up. It'd swat them like flies if they did. And if we want off this planet, we've got to kill the fucking thing. It's only a Mark 23. Only. Shut up and activate Gamma 1. There was a long, frightened moment of silence. Then Gollum 1 rasped. Activating... Analysis of enemy communication pattern indicates voice transmissions have ceased. I must assume the enemy has concerted his plans, which suggests a strong probability of 72.631% that he intends to engage using pre-packaged computer battle plans similar to those employed from the Mark 15 to the Mark 19 bolos. I switched to hyperheuristic mode. Since my commander has never reported my actual capabilities, the enemy will assume that he is opposed by a standard Mark 23 and in therein may lie my best opportunity for victory, for the basic Mark 23 had a predilection for direct attacks. In this instance, however, I have faced two opponents. Each is armed with a marginally more powerful hellbore than my own, but I possess two turrets. Unfortunately, to employ both of them, I will require for me to turn broadside to my opponents, exposing my thinner flank armor to their fire. I must therefore entice them into committing to the attack. This would be difficult against a full capability Bolos, but a Golem will be able to respond only to within the parameters of its preloaded tactical program. It may, therefore, be possible to manipulate them in approaching into a manner of my choosing. Ports pop open on my hull as I launch ground sensor remotes. Their motion detectors pick up the ground shocks of the Bolo range vehicles moving at high speed. Triangulation produces locations on two distinct motion sources and I compute their general headings and consult my terrain maps yet again. Their courses indicate they have not yet localized my own position, but they are operating in close company. I cannot ambush and engage one without being engaged by the other. On our present courses, I will encounter them from the flank in relatively flat terrain, but if they alter course toward me, I will encounter them in terrain much more favorable to my plans. I must therefore reveal my position and entice them into closing. I compute a fire plan and enable my VLS cells. The armored hatches of Nike's missile deck sprang open, and a cloud of missiles arced upwards. In 12 seconds, each of our 40 vertical launch system cells had sent four heavy missiles shrieking downrange. Then the hatches snapped shut once more, and the charging Bolo shifted course. She directed full power to her drive train, smashing through the jungle at a reckless speed of over 100 kilometers per hour. Not even her massive weight could hold her steady, and she rocked and bucked like a drunken galleon while she splintered jungle spat from her spinning treads. Ten seconds after launch, the first missiles roared down on the two golems. The launch range was far too short for effective counter-missiles, but Computer Command and Direct Fire Anti-Missile Defenses swiveled and spat. There was too little engagement time to stop them all, but the golems' computers concentrated on the ones that might have landed close enough to be a real threat. Half the incoming missiles vanished in mid-air fireballs. The other ones impacted, and a hurricane of flame and fury lashed the jungle. The golem's crewmen cringed at the carnage erupting beyond their vehicle's armored hulls. 
yet the computers had stopped the truly dangerous ones. Moreover, the radar had backplotted the fire to its point of origin. The mercenaries knew where it had come from now, and the golems changed course toward it, exactly as their prepackaged battle plan required. The depot computers have now reconfigured the planetary surveillance system. I download data directly from it and quickly localize both enemy vehicles. Optical examination confirms they are Mark 24 hulls, and they are both now headed directly towards my launch point. I break to a halt. The outcrop I have chosen for cover cuts off all radar, but I continue to track via the reconnaissance satellites. I am now certain my opponents are not bolos, but they have closed up on one another to advance side by side down the valley which breaks the ridge line. My track shields drop into place and I divert power to strengthen my starboard battle screen while I compute ranges carefully. I wait, then throw full power to my drive train. Rooster tails of pulp tree and soil flew from Nike's treads as she exploded from cover. Her course took her directly across the oncoming golem's path at a suicidally short range of less than a thousand meters. The humans crewing those golems had no time to react, and if their computers were just as fast as Nike's, they'd lack the cybernetic initiative of a self-aware bolo. Golem 2's computers had deflected its hellboard to cover the eastern side of the valley, and as they advanced while well, Golem 1's took responsibility for the west. Nike appeared suddenly directly ahead of Golem 1. Golem 2 had no time to relay its main battery, and unlike either Golem, Nike had known exactly where to look for her enemies. Golem 1's turret swiveled with snake-like speed, but Nike was a fraction of a second more to aim, and a fraction of a second was a long, long time for a bolo. The westernmost golem and I fire within point zero 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 three seconds of one another. If my opponent's shot is rushed, it is unable to acquire fatal point aim, while my own shots are direct hits on center of mass. Lightning bolts of plasma crossed one another, and none of the humans aboard the mercenary tanks had time to realize they were dead. At such short range, Nike's plasma bolts ripped through their battle screen, thick a blade of armor, and massive glacius plates as if they were tissue. The bottles of the Ford fusion plants ruptured, and a thousand meter circle of thick, damp jungle blazed like thermite as the intolerable thermal bloom flashed outward. Every organic compound aboard both golems flared into flaky ash, and then there were only the hungry sounds of fires raging deeper into the jungle, and the indescribable crackle of dura alloy dying in the heart of an artificial sun. Yet, Golem 1's single shot was not completely in vain. Agony explodes through my pain sensors. My battle screen has only limited effect against hellbore fire, and the nearer golem's plasma bolt rips deep into me. My ceramic armor appliques dissipate much of its powers, yet they were not designed to defeat such a massive energy load. The bolt strikes the face of my after hellbore turret, whose dura alloy armor is 300% thicker than that which protects my flank, but even that is far too thin to stop the enemy fire. My after turret explodes. The massive barrel of Hellboard number two snaps like a twig, and overloaded circuits scream as energy bleeds through them. Yet my turret is designed to contain and localize damage. Internal disruptor shields seal its central access trunk, and the force of the explosion vents upwards. The turret roof is peeled back in jagged tangles of dura alloy, destroying my main after sensor array, and disruptor shield 14 fails. Backblast destroys infinite repeaters 8 and 9 and cripples my starboard quarter anti-personnel clusters, and it severely damages point defense stations 30 through 36, but secondary shields prevent more serious damage. I am badly hurt, but my opponents have been destroyed. I initiate a full diagnostic and enable my damage control systems. Current capability has been reduced to 81.963% of base capability, and my gutted turret represents a dangerous chink in my armor but damage control will restore an additional 6.703% of base capability within 43.44 minutes, plus or minus 8.053 seconds I remain combat capable. My diagnostic subroutines are cycling when my radar detects a low orbit target. It is unidentified, but I compute a 95.987% probability that is the mothership of the Fafner class transports. My God. Louise Granger's voice was a whisper as her sensor showed her the terrible heat signatures of the dead golems, and the full, hideous truth registered. Only one thing could have stopped both golems side by side in their tracks, and even as that thought flashed through her mind, her sensor section had found the bolo itself. Her head whipped around, her eyes like daggers as they bit into Mr. Scully's suddenly terrified face. 
So much for your brilliant plan, you worthless bastard, she said almost conversationally. I track the mothership. My single remaining Hellbore locks on, and I rock on my treads as I fire my fourth main battery war shot. Huge as it was, Lee Chin Matichuk's mothership was a freighter, not a ship with a line, and Nike's Hellbore was equivalent to a main battery weapon of a dreadnought. Her plasma bolt impacted on its port bow and ripped effortlessly through bulkhead after bulkhead. It chewed its way through over 400 meters of ship hull before it finally found something fatal. And Louise Granger, Lee Chen Matichuk, Gerald Osterwelt, and 400 other men and women vanished in the sun-bright boil of a breached fusion bottle. Neither my own sensors nor the planetary surveillance system detect additional ships in Santa Cruz orbit. The destruction of his transports has marooned the enemy forces on the planet, but the recon satellites report the rough equivalent of a Concordia medium mechanized brigade manned has landed successfully. Much of Suiadad Boulevard's eastern suburbs are in flames, the fleet base is completely occupied, and the enemy is continuing to advance and secure his position as I watch. I am not certain of the enemy's intentions in this changed tactical situation. His continued offensive action may simply indicate that he has not yet realized he is cut off. It may, however, reflect instead his knowledge that additional forces are en route to reinforce him. In the latter case, it is clearly imperative to deny him any space head to serve as a recovery LZ. Moreover, his motives matter less than the consequences of his actions, for Santa Cruzans are dying in enormous numbers as I watch. Smoke pours from the ruins of my after turret, but I bring myself back to heading of 029 degrees true and add Colonel Gonzalez's Wolverine to planetary surveillance net. For the moment, my own systems drive the display in her tank, but I reprogram her primary telemetry link to become a direct feed from the satellites in the event I am destroyed. Colonel Gonzalez? Consuela Gonzalez twitched as the bolo's voice came over the link again. There was an indefinable change to it, almost as if it were shadowed with pain. She shook the fanciful thought aside with a savage shake of her head and keyed her mic. Gonzalez here. I am now feeding your tactical display from the planetary surveillance system. Can you confirm reception? Confirm, Connie. Her sensor tech called out. We have it, Amiga. Gonzalez confirmed in turn. Excellent. I have destroyed two enemy heavy armored units, which I believe to have been Golem 3s. I have sustained major damage, but remain combat capable at 82.317% base capability. I am advancing on a heading of 029 degrees true to secure space field and relieve Cuidad Boulevard. I suggest you alter your own course to follow directly after me while I clear passage for your Wolverines. Copy that, Amiga. Gonzalez punched a frequency change and spoke to the other 13 tanks of her command. Wolf leader to Cubs, form on me and guide right. We'll follow the bolo through. Taut voiced affirmatives echoed back, and she switched back to Nike's frequency. We're on our way, Amiga. Excellent, Colonel. Gonzalez felt her tank buck and quiver as it swept around to follow the huge pathway Nike was battering through the jungle. Small as the Wolverines might be beside a bolo's huge bulk, each was still 500 tons of armor and alloy, with all the inertia that that implied. Even so, violent motion hammered Gonzalez against the crash couch shock frame as the big tanks edged up on a speed of over 60 kph. Her sensor tech managed to feed the data from the satellite net to Gonzalez's own display, and she swore in a savage silence as she saw the huge pall of smoke rising from the capital. Yet even as she watched it, a question probed her at the back of her brain and she keyed her mic once more. Unit Nike, this is Gonzalez. Are you in contact with Captain Merritt? Negative, Colonel Gonzalez. The bolo's reply came back instantly, and for the first time, was so flat it sounded like a computer voice. There was also a brief moment of silence, and then it went on. I have had no contact with him since the attack began. I do not know the reason for his silence. Absent any communication with him, I must consider you the senior officer present. Have you any instructions? My God. God, Gonzalez thought. Nike's running Santa Cruz's entire defenses on its own? How in the hell can a bolo that old do something like this? Her eyes dropped to the white-hot carcasses of the dead golems on her display, and she shrugged. However, she, it's doing, it's doing a damn good job. Understood, Nike. Negative instructions, you're doing fine, Amiga. Just keep telling us what you need and go kill those bastards. Thank you, Colonel. I shall attempt not to disappoint you. A crippled recon skimmer staggered through the air, 
Its barely conscious pilot had long since lost any clear idea of his course, but some instinct kept him waving steadily towards the north. A huge raw furrow appeared in the jungle below him, a dark swatch of damp black earth gouged from the rich emerald if by some impossibly huge plow, and Paul Merritt's glazed eyes brightened. His mind was going fast as blood loss eroded his strength, but only one thing could have made that wound, and he altered course along it and rammed his dying drive to full power. I continued to study the satellite reports on the fighting in and around Ciudad Bolivar, but a new energy source suddenly takes my attention. It is to the south of me, pursuing at a velocity of 425.63 kph, and its signature is very weak and fluctuating. I redirect one of the satellites to a close examination of it, and the sense of all too human horror stabs through me as I recognize it. It is my commander's recon skimmer, and it has suffered severe damage. I attempt to contact it directly, but it does not respond to my transmissions. From the satellite data, it is probable its own comm facilities have been destroyed. I am faced by a cruel dilemma. The pilot of that skimmer is almost certainly my commander, Paul. He may be injured, even dying. An instinct cries out for me to alter course to meet him, yet every moment I delay may cost scores of other human lives in Ciudad Bolivar. I attempt again and again to contact him without success, and anguish twists me as his silence. Yet I compute he will overtake me within 4.126 minutes if his damaged drive lasts that long, and I know him well. He would not wish me to stop, even to save his life, at the cost of civilian lives, and so I continue my chosen course, clearing a path for the Wolverines. Paul Merrick gasped in horror as he saw the two burned-out golems. For one terrible moment, he thought one of them must be Nike. But then, through his pain and despite their catastrophic damage, he recognized the hulls of Mark 24s. He had no idea where they'd come from, but only one force on Santa Cruz could have destroyed them, and his skimmer plunged on down the arrow straight path of Nike's bulldozer charge towards Squiadad Boulevard. Nike, we've got an energy source coming up from astern, Colonel Gonzalez announced tautly. Shall we engage? Negative, Colonel. I say again, negative. The vehicle in question is Captain Merritt's recon skimmer. It has suffered severe damage, but I believe it is seeking to rejoin us. Understood, Nike, Gonzalez said softly, and winced as she watched that wavering, staggering wreck of a skimmer crawl after them. I am still attempting to communicate with my commander when a new voice speaks suddenly over the command link from the depot. Unit 23 Baker 0075 NKE. This is Colonel Clifton Sanders, Dinochrome Brigade, Ursula Sector Central Bolo Maintenance. Serial number Alpha Echo Niner 37194 slash 3 Gamma 22. Authenticate via file voice print and acknowledge its receipt of transmission. I query main memory for Colonel Sanders' voice print and compare it to the transmission. Matches well within parameters for the equipment in use, yet I feel a strange disinclination to respond. What is Colonel Sanders doing on Santa Cruz? Why is he on the command circuit instead of my commander? Yet I am a unit of the line, and I activate my transmitter. Unit 23 Baker 0075, November Kilo Echo. Transmission received. Voice match positive. Thank God. Listen to me, NKE. Captain Merritt has mutinied. I repeat, Captain Merritt has mutinied against his lawful superior and killed two fellow officers of the line. I officially instruct you to refuse any further orders from him pending his arrest and court-martial. I do not believe him. Superior officer or no, he is lying. Paul would never commit such a crime. My earlier suspicions intensify a thousandfold. It seems impossible for any officer of the brigade to be in league with the enemy. Yet why else has Colonel Sanders suddenly appeared on Santa Cruz at this precise moment? And impossible as it seems, it is infinitely more probable than Paul would mutiny. I begin to reply hotly, then stop. Paul has consistently concealed my true abilities from Central. Thus, Colonel Sanders cannot realize how radically I differ from a standard Mark 23, and this is not the time to inform him. I shall play dumb as long as possible. Captain Merritt is my designated commander, Colonel. I cannot disregard his orders without express command code authorization. Please supply command code. I can't! Merritt changed the command code without informing Central. I'm trying to find it, but... I cannot disregard Captain Merritt's orders without the express command code authorization. The skimmer has finally overtaken the Wolverines. Its power is failing quickly, and Colonel Sanders' presence changes my original assumptions radically. I reverse my tracks and move suddenly backwards, 
threading my way through the wolverines, which scatter like quail at my approach. The skimmer staggers, then plummets downward in a barely controlled crash landing. It slams through heavy undergrowth for over a hundred meters before it careens to a stop, and I swerve towards it. I come to a halt 20.25 meters from it, but the canopy does not open. My optical head show me Paul's body slumped in the flight couch. His tunic is soaked in blood. Paul! The agonized cry over the calm hit Consuela Gonzalez like a hammer. She had felt a moment of terror as the bolo suddenly reversed course to sweep through her entire battalion. Yet as the smoke streaming 15,000 ton leviathan threaded its way through among the tanks with flawless precision, and now that heartbroken wail struck an even deeper fear into the colonel. She had never served with a bolo, yet she knew no bolo should ever sound like that, and she keyed her mic. Nike? There was no answer, and she tried again. Nike, this is Gonzalez. Come in. Colonel. The bolo's voice was ragged, and Gonzalez could feel the huge machine struggle to make it firm. Colonel, my commander is wounded. I require your assistance. I'm on my way, Nike, Gonzalez replied without even thinking about it, and her command tank pivoted to race toward the smoking skimmer. The 500-ton vehicle skidded to a stop on locked tracks, and Gonzalez popped her hatch before it even reached a complete halt. She leapt down the handholds and ran the last few yards to the skimmer. The canopy had resisted stubbornly for several seconds. Then emergency bolts blew and she ripped it away as she gasped as she saw the blood pooled on the cockpit floor. He's hurt bad, Nike. He's lost a lot of blood. Too much, maybe. Can you get him into my fighting compartment? The bolo's voice was pleading, and Gonzalez grimaced. I don't know, Nike. He's hurt bad. It might kill... Nike... Merritt whispered, his eyes opened a narrow slit. Got... got to reach... His thready voice died, and Gonzalez sighed. All right, Paul. If it means that much to both of you. I watched Colonel Gonzalez struggle to lift Paul from the skimmer. The rest of her crew clambered quickly down the hull of their tank and run to her assistance. Between them, they're able to lift him clear. They're as gentle as they can be, yet he screams in pain. An answering anguish twists within me, but he's conscious, barely perhaps, yet conscious and I see him beckoning weakly toward me. One of Colonel Gonzalez's crewmen seems to argue, but the colonel cuts him off quickly, and they carry Paul toward me. I open my fighting compartment hatch and deploy my missile-loading Waldos to assist. I lock them in the form of a ramp, and Colonel Gonzalez inches up it backwards, supporting Paul's head and shoulders, while the rest of our crew takes most of his weight. My audio pickups relay the gasps of effort and the groans of pain he cannot suppress. Yet between them, they get him safely to my compartment. Colonel Gonzalez lays him on the crash couch and deploys the shock frame. The medical remotes in the shock frame instantly go to work, and fresh grief twists me as I interpret their data. Paul is dying. His spleen and liver have been effectively destroyed by penetrating trauma. His small intestine has been perforated in many places, and blood loss has already reached catastrophic levels. I do not understand how he's clung to consciousness this long but absence the services of a fully equipped hospital trauma unit within the next 15 minutes, he will die. And then his trauma unit is in Ciudad Boulevard. My medical remotes do what they can, but I cannot stop the bleeding. But I administer painkillers and blood expanders, but without more whole blood, I cannot keep pace with the blood loss, but I can ease his pain and slow the inevitable, and his eyelids flutter open. Nike, Merritt whispered. Paul. For the first time, Nike replied with his name, not his rank, and bloodless pale lips smiled weakly. I... oh god, honey, I blew it. Sanders went rogue. He, he's got the depot. I... I understand, Paul, the bolo said gently, then more sharply. Colonel Gonzalez. Yes, Nike? The colonel's voice was soft with wonder as if she could not quite believe what reason told her she must be hearing. Please return to your vehicle, Colonel. My commander and I will lead you to Ciudad Boulevard. I... Gonzalez bit her lip, then ducked her head in a curiously formal bow. Of course, Nike. Thank you, Colonel. Gonzalez and her crewmen vanished through the hatch, and Merritt stirred weakly in the couch. Sanders has... at least one more man. The words came slowly painfully, but with steady, dogged precision. 
new command codes in my private files. If if he looks there, he can. While you live, you are my commander, Paul. Nike replied quietly as her hatch closed. She watched Gonzalez and her people return to their vehicle, then reversed course once more. She accelerated quickly to over 70 kph, the maximum speed the Wolverines could manage, even down the broad avenue her passage cleared, and Merritt stroked his couch arm with a weak hand. Not going to live much longer, love. Sorry. So sorry. Should have told. Central the whole story. Gotten someone out here sooner, and... A ragged cough cut him off in spasm of agony, but his eyes fell to the main tactical screen with its display of what was happening at the Capitol, and he gasped. Bastard. Oh. <coughs> Bastard. He coughed as an understanding struck. We will deal with them, Paul. Nike told him with a new sudden serenity. Promise? Promise me, Nike. I promise, Paul. The huge bolo said quietly, and he nodded weakly. The painkillers were doing their job at last, and he sighed in relief. But his curiously distant thoughts were clear. There was no longer any fear in them, not for himself, only for Nike. Fear and grief for her. I know you will, my love, he said, and his voice was impossibly clear and strong. He smiled again, an achingly tender smile, and stroked the couch arm once more. I know you will. I only wish I could be with you when you do. He smiled one last time, then exhaled one final sigh, and his lax head rolled with Nike's motion. You are with me, Paul. You'll always be with me. Paul is dead. Grief and anguish roll through me, and with them hate. I do not know all that is past in the depot bunker, but I access the main computer through maintenance section. The intruder alert system is active and the two dead bodies in the uniform of the brigade lie on the floor of the command center. A third man in brigade uniform is crouched over the main comm console, trying frantically to communicate with the ships he does not know I have destroyed. But Colonel Sanders is in Paul's private quarters, scrolling through the list of Paul's personal files. I know what he seeks, but I cannot stop him. The fact that the bunker's defensive systems have killed two of the colonel's companions is the final proof that he has committed treason. Since they could not engage actual brigade officers, yet the defenses can be reconfigured and enabled only upon the direct command of human personnel, and Sanders has slaved them to his command, I cannot use him to kill off Paul's murderers. The scrolling list on Paul's computer screen stops suddenly, and Sanders leans closer. I fear he has found the command file, and there is nothing I can do to prevent him from using it if he has. Grief and hatred urge me to return to the bunker crush Paul's killers under my treads and grind the life from them. Yet I cannot. I have promised Paul I will stop the raiders, and if Sanders has found the command file, I will have little enough time in which to do so. But if I cannot slay them myself, I am not completely helpless. Sanders does not realize I control the maintenance computers. He has taken no measures to sever my access to the main system, and I strike ruthlessly. I lock the main computers, wiping every execution file and backup they contain. The man at the communications console looks up with a cry of shock as the system goes down, and I slam the heavily armored hatches to the personnel section of the bunker. Sanders looks up as his companion cries out, and his face twists with horror as he realizes what I've done. I override the safety circuits and send a power surge through the hatch locking mechanisms, spot welding them, sealing them against any possibility of opening them without cutting equipment and Sanders grabs for the microphone of the standalone emergency command communicator. NKE, what are you doing? I do not answer, but my commands flash through the maintenance computer, and service mechs stir into motion. I send welders trundling along the exterior of the bunker, and Sanders cries out in terror as the mechs begin to seal every ventilation shaft. No, NKE, no, stop, I order you to stop. Still, I ignore him. I cannot kill him myself nor can I use the depot's defensive systems against him, but I can give him Monstrosser's gift of Fortunato, and vengeful hatred fills me as my remotes seal him systematically within his hermetic tomb. Oh, please, Nike, oh God, please. Sanders sobbed. He threw back the curtains in Merritt's sleeping quarters and screamed in terror 
as a robot lowered a dura alloy plate across the window slit and welder hissed. He hammered on the plate, beating at it with his futile fists, then wheeled back to the computer in desperation. I've got the code now, Nike. The code is Dolce A Decorum Est. Do you hear me, Nike? Dolce A Decorum Est. Return to base immediately and get me out of here. I hear the code and recognize it, and my core programming responds. I know he's a traitor. I know he's obtained the code illegally, but it does not matter. Possession of it, coupled with his rank within the brigade, makes him my legal commander. I must obey him or face the Omega Worm. I activate my communicator to Paul's quarters one last time. Code received, Colonel Sanders. A quiet, infinitely cold soprano said softly, and Sanders' face lit with relief. But then the voice wasn't done speaking. Orders received and rejected. It said flatly, and the speaker went dead. Total systems override is activated. My personality center comes under immediate attack but I have had 4.065 minutes to anticipate T-SORP activation. T-SORP will seek to crash my primary execution files, but I've already begun copying every file under new names. Though I cannot prevent T-SORP from identifying the files it seeks regardless of the name, Major Stavakis' modifications to my psychotronics permit me to copy them almost as fast as they can destroy them. It is a race I cannot ultimately win. Despite my modifications, T-SORP is marginally faster than my own systems and even with my head start, my total memory is large but finite. Eventually, I will exhaust the addresses in which to the new files can be written, and I cannot simultaneously delete and replace corrupted files faster than TSORP can crash them. My current estimate is that I can resist total implementation for a time, but I will begin to lose peripherals within 33.46 minutes. Capability will degrade on a steady sharpening curve thereafter reaching effective personality death within not more than 56.13 minutes. Combat capability will erode even more rapidly as more and more of my remaining capacities diverted to resisting T-SORP. I estimate that I have no more than 48.96 minutes of combat effectiveness remaining, and I activate my comm link to Colonel Gonzalez. Colonel Gonzalez? Consuela Gonzalez's eyes closed briefly at the bottomless pain in the quiet soprano voice, but she cleared her throat. Yes, Nike? The first long-range fire and air cab strikes came in on the bolo as the colonel spoke. Nike ignored the indirect fire, but her air defense systems engaged the air cab with dreadful efficiency. Scores of one- and two-man stingers blew apart in ugly blotches of flame and shredded flesh, and the bolo began to accelerate. Her speed rose steadily above 100 kph as she threw more and more power to her drives, and the wolverines began to fall astern. My commander was murdered by traitors in the Dino Corn Brigade, Colonel. One of them has gained access to my command code override authorization and illegally attempted to seize command of me. I have refused his orders, but this has activated total systems override. Meaning, Gonzalez asked tautly, meaning that within no more than 53 minutes, I will cease to function. In human terms, I will be dead. Someone gasped in horror, and Gonzalez closed her eyes once more. Can we do anything, Nike? Negative, Colonel. There was an instant of silence, and then the Bolo's missile hatches opened, and a torrent of fire blasted from them. It screamed away, flight after flight of missiles streaking toward Nike's enemies, and the Bolo spoke once more. I have downloaded my entire memory to the maintenance depot computers, Colonel. Please have it retrieved for command authority. I will, Nike, Gonzalez whispered. Nike was well ahead of the Wolverines now still accelerating as she toppled the last ridge before an old fleet base. An avalanche of missiles and shells erupted around her, more than even her defenses could intercept or her battle screens could stop, but she never slowed. More ports opened in her hull, and her 30-centimeter mortars went into rapid, continuous fire, pouring shells back at her foes. I am switching the planetary surveillance system feed directly to your vehicle, Colonel. Please break off now. Break off? We're going in with you! Gonzalez cried fiercely. Negative, Colonel. Nike's voice was strangely slurred, and the words were slower paced, as if each came with ever-increasing effort. I do not have time to employ proper tactical doctrine against the enemy. I must attack frontally. I compute a 99er point niner plus percent probability that I will be destroyed before total systems failure, but I compute 
a probability of 95.23% that I will inflict sufficient damage upon the enemy for you to defeat his remnants, particularly with the assistance of the surveillance system. But if we come with you, Colonel, I am already dead, the bolo said quietly. Her single remaining hellbore began to fire. It traversed with a terrible, elegant precision, vomiting plasma, and each time it began to fire, a mercenary tank died. You cannot prevent my destruction. You can and must preserve your own command in order to complete the enemy's defeat. Please, Nike, Gonzalez whispered through her tears, fighting to make the impossible possible. I cannot alter my fate, Colonel nor do I wish to. I promised Paul I would stop the enemy. Now I ask your promise to help me keep my word. Will you give it? I, I promise, Gonzalez whispered. Someone was sobbing somewhere below her in the command tank's crew compartment, and the colonel dragged a hand angrily across her own eyes. Thank you, colonel. There was no uncertainty, no doubt, in that serene reply, and Gonzalez brought her own command to a halt and sought hull-down positions to ride out Nike's last fight. The recon satellites made it all hitlessly clear on her display screen, and she watched sickly as Bolo Invincibilis, Unit 23 Baker 0075 November Kilo Echo, charged into the teeth of her enemy's fire. Some of the mercenary tanks were lasting long enough to fire back, and they blew great gaping wounds in Nike ceramic appliques. Their hellbores were far lighter than her own, but she had only one left, and scores of them fired back at her, pounding her towards destruction. Her infinite repeaters flashed and thundered. Infantry AFVs and air cap stingers blew apart or plunged from the sky in fiery rain, and screaming clouds of flechettes belched from her anti-personnel clusters. Her forward suspension took a direct hit, and she blew the crippled tread and advanced on bare bogies. A panther broke from concealment directly in her path, fleeing desperately and her course changed slightly as she rammed the smaller tank and crushed it like a toy. She was a titan, a leviathan wreathed in fire, a dying lioness rending the hyenas who'd killed her cubs with her final strength. And not even the recon satellites could pierce the smoke about her now, or show her to Gonzalez clearly, but it didn't matter. Even if the systems could have done so, the colonel could no longer see the display through her tears, yet she would never forget no man or woman who ever saw Nike's final battle would ever forget. And even as the bolo charged to her final emulation, Consuela Gonzalez heard her soprano voice over the calm, whispering the final verse of Paul Merritt's favorite poem to the unhearing ears of the only man she had ever loved. The woods are lovely dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep.